It's hardly a hot take at this point to say that 2023 was a pretty unbelievable year for video games. When it came to massive big budget releases, we had countless unbelievable titles. Resident Evil 4, Tears of the Kingdom, Baldur's Gate 3, Spider-Man 2, Super Mario Bros. Wonder, Final Fantasy 16, just to name a few. And that's not even mentioning others like Hi-Fi Rush, Octopath Traveler 2, Sea of Stars, Armored Core 6, and countless more, all of which were drenched in critical acclaim. There truly was something for everyone to fall in love with, no matter what their taste in games was. And yet, underneath all this, I can't help but feel that one game last year was more criminally overlooked than any other. One game that I've heard almost no talk of across the internet. One game that despite having a remarkable 98% overwhelmingly positive user score on Steam, did not get a single mention at the Game Awards. That game is Bomb Rush Cyberpunk. The game released in August, but I didn't actually get around to it until the very tail end of December after a few strong recommendations from friends. It was the kind of game that I warmed up to in literal seconds, and I proceeded to spend the rest of my playthrough repeatedly asking myself why the hell I put it off for so long. So just what is it about Bob Marsh Cyberpunk that makes it so endearing? First thing to address here, this is very obviously a spiritual successor to the Jet Set Radio series. And I've never played those games, but they've always occupied some kind of space in my mind. I remember seeing the original in the Sega Dreamcast collection on Xbox 360 when I was just a kid trying to play Sonic Adventure, and it's always been one of those games that I've had a mild interest in ever since. So since I don't have any real experience with those games, I can't speak to how well Bomber of Cyberpunk evolves those ideas. But what I can say is that if the JSR games play anything like this one, then my interest in them has just skyrocketed. About the actual game itself though, well remember how I said it only took me a few seconds to immediately warm up to it? This is why. This title screen is so striking. The appealing but minimalist visuals, the incredibly groovy music, the fact that all the movements on the menu make DJ noises, it just smacks you in the face with style and confidence before you're even ready to get started. And this confidence persists throughout the entire game. The first thing I have to talk about is the soundtrack. So normally I approach talking about music and games by discussing how it enhances the game's tone or mood at different points, but with Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, it's a very interesting case, because lots of the songs here weren't actually composed for the game at all. A large chunk of the music in this game is licensed, you could practically find all of these songs on the internet well before the game released. I believe this serves as a callback to the Jet Set Radio series, which as far as I understand uses a pretty similar tactic with its soundtracks, but it also serves to make Bomb Rush Cyberpunk sound pretty unlike anything else that I've ever played. Gone are the typical video game soundtrack cliches of certain types of songs fitting certain types of moments, it's essentially just a playlist that's constantly looping while you play. And honestly, I love it. Look, this stuff is not at all within my comfort zone when it comes to the music that I typically listen to, but despite that, I find it almost impossible to not become entranced by all the songs used in this game. The music here is just earworm after earworm, each with its own distinctly infectious energy. I already played In the Pocket by Flamclap, which plays on the title screen, but that's just one example. Whether it's the more chill Japanese flow of Condensed Milk by Cybermilk, The pounding noisy beats of Scraped on the Way Out by Kilowatts. Or the relentlessly catchy upbeat banger that is I Wanna Know by Too Mellow. Every song in this game has fantastic energy. And that's not even all of it. While there are tons of licensed tracks used, there are also a bunch of originals composed specifically for this game, and they blend in seamlessly. And some of them are even composed by Hideki Naganuma himself. And of course, with his work on Jet Set Radio, it's no surprise that his style fits perfectly here.
Regardless of whether it's licensed or original though, every last track in this game has this incredible momentum to it that suits the pace of the game so unbelievably well. As for how the game looks, well, I expected it to be stylized and cel shaded just from the game's box art alone, but I really did not expect this game to be meticulously constructed in the exact same style as a Sega Dreamcast game. Absolutely everything here looks straight out of a game from the sixth generation of consoles, from the low poly character models to the relatively simple animations, to the pixelated face textures, the lack of voice acting aside from a few key lines that never match the actual dialogue, even the file size coming in at a ludicrously small 2 gigabytes. Everything about this game makes me feel like I'm playing a flawless remaster of some undiscovered hidden gem from that era. We've seen so many indie games capitalize on nostalgia for pixel art, but it's a lot rarer to see a new game emulate that style of early 3D visuals, and practically unheard of for a game to replicate it as accurately as this. I seriously love everything about how this game looks. So it's fair to say that I'm in love with this game's presentation on all fronts. But amazing presentation alone can't quite carry a game. So what else is it about Bomber Cyberfunk that sticks with me? Well, let's look at the story next. It's a fairly interesting premise, honestly. The opening of the game has you playing as this person named Fo, who we quickly learn is a writer, which in this world essentially means a graffiti artist. Above just that, though, he's one of the most famous writers of New Amsterdam, one of the big three. You're busted out of prison, coming to grips with controls in this tutorial area, and everything's going great until all of a sudden... You wake up and your character's head has been replaced by a robot one, but as a result you've lost all memories and personality and are now going by the name Red. Here we learn a bit more about the world and find that Felix, another member of the Big Three, was killed after becoming All City, which essentially means that he had dominated the graffiti scene in all five sections of New Amsterdam. Anyways, Felix was mysteriously killed, leaving every crew around to race to become the next All City in his place. And that includes the crew that Red has just formed with his rescuer Trice and another character named Belle. And as the Bomb Rush crew is also trying to go all city, having Foe's old body is just that extra push of motivation. There's a bit more to it than just that though, as there does seem to be a pretty good chance that DJ Cyber, the other member of the Big Three that killed Foe, has kept his head alive. So naturally Red wants to find it and get it back. So with those two goals in mind, there's a decent mystery and a pretty fun premise to kick off the game. There's some fun twists and turns along the way that I won't bother spoiling because I don't find them essential to my opinions on the story itself, but I will say that for the most part, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk's story held my interest, and I was ultimately pretty satisfied with the directions it ended up going in. That being said though, I can't sit here and pretend this is really gonna blow anyone away, or even be all that impressive to most people. It's good for sure, and decently interesting, but ultimately I don't see this leaving any kind of lasting impact. My perspective did change a little bit on the story after replaying it for this video though. I paid more direct attention to it and it made me appreciate how its simplicity does a really solid job at providing a non-intrusive backdrop for this kind of game. However, it's also a bit more involved than most players would probably assume at first. If you're like me, this means that your first playthrough, you're not really going to be paying close attention to many of the cutscenes. When I went back to revisit though, I realized just how many of these early cutscenes practically give away the major revelations of the game way before they're actually revealed. It's definitely a bit much in my opinion, some of these scenes could have easily been removed and the story only would have been better for it. Still though, you'd be hard pressed to find any fan of this game that genuinely cares a ton about the story. It's clearly not a primary focus and it's not trying to be either. Like I said before, having something relatively low priority only serves to suit a game like this that is very clearly gameplay centric above all else. So even if I'm not totally in love with the story, it's not an issue whatsoever, especially because what's here is good. So how's that gameplay then? The gameplay is without a doubt the core of Bomb Rush Cyberpunk, and it's the single aspect that makes this game so addicting to keep coming back to, and above all else, just so much fun. Before I get too ahead of myself though, let's get into the core mechanics here. So like many skating games, you're always encouraged to push for the highest score possible in a single combo. 
Here, combos break by touching the ground, which is simple enough. The most basic way to get points is to perform tricks, which is done with the face buttons. And as far as I can tell, the kind of tricks that you do doesn't really matter as long as you're consistently doing them, but tricks alone won't get you very far if you don't make sure to manual on the ground to keep your combo going in between rails. The manual doesn't last very long though, so it's not something you can completely abuse to keep an infinite combo, but it is a very useful tool to move between areas. So that's all pretty standard, but where it starts to get interesting is the separation of your base score and your score multiplier. You can increase the multiplier by doing a number of actions which are considered more valuable. Things like leaning into hard corners, wall running on a billboard, launching off a half pipe, etc. As you can imagine, these will make scores skyrocket pretty quickly, and tricks that used to provide minuscule points will add thousands each time with a high enough multiplier. So the trick to getting really high scores is to make sure to keep the base score consistently growing while hitting as many multiplier tricks as you can. The base score is still important, of course, but the multiplier is where you're going to start seeing the really big changes come in. These multiplier actions can't just be repeated infinitely, though. Once you hit one of them once in a certain spot, you won't be able to increase your multiplier at that same spot again until your combo resets. This means that you're constantly scouting around the level trying to form a path to get as many multiplier increases as possible, while also keeping your combo going as long as possible. And this also requires lots of on-the-fly decision making and occasionally tight execution. This combination of planning and making quick readjustments makes such an incredibly compelling gameplay loop, and it's incredibly easy to get lost in this game for hours. And only adding to that feeling is how fantastic the game feels to control. I haven't played Jet Set Radio for myself, but I've heard enough talk about the series that I know some modern players consider the game's controls to feel quite clunky. And whether you agree with that assessment or not, the same absolutely cannot be said for Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. The game is snappy and precise with a simple but effective sense of momentum, and it just feels amazing to move around here even without any clear goal in sight. There is a bit more to it than what I've already mentioned though. Another one of the key aspects here is graffiti. Painting graffiti over designated areas will increase your reputation in the area, so you're always trying to hit as much of it as possible. Applying graffiti itself is pretty cool. Once you approach one of these spots, a certain number of dots will show up on your screen depending on the size of it, and how you connect those dots will determine what piece of art your character throws up onto the space. This is a small but pretty cool method of player self-expression. Putting up graffiti will also increase your heat meter, which sends the police after you. What starts as a mild and easily ignored inconvenience can quickly turn into a full-scale manhunt with snipers and attack helicopters on your ass relentlessly. It's pretty tough to move around with all that going on, so once things start getting hectic, you'll want to dip away into one of these public toilet stalls to hide and reset the meter. As annoying as the police hunts can be if you have an active goal in mind, the chase can also be pretty thrilling in and of its own right, especially in a game that feels as good to play as this one. Most of the time, playing this game is pretty relaxed, but getting your heat level up super high can really force you to get your head in the game, and you need to constantly be on high alert. Aside from that, there are multiple different characters and move styles, but they don't really change all that much. Everyone in the Bomb Rush crew is playable, so you've got the protagonist Red, but also Bell and Trice, as well as a few others that you pick up along the way. You can change characters by going to a dance pad, but as far as I can tell, they're nothing more than a cosmetic skin. Move styles are slightly more interesting, though. There's the standard skateboard, inline skates, and a BMX bike. These still mostly play very similar to each other, but there's a few specific actions that only one can take. Skateboards can interact with these red poles, inline skates can break a specific kind of glass, and BMX bikes can open specifically marked doors. Honestly, I really don't see why these exist other than to get you to use the other movesets, but they don't really have a negative effect on the experience, so I don't take too much issue with them. Overall, it's just nice to have a little variety with the move styles, even if they are so close to each other. One other mechanic that I thought would be way more important than it actually is, is the boost. It's pretty self-explanatory, if you've ever played the modern 3D Sonic games, it's like a less powerful version of that. It's got its occasional uses for sure, it can be really helpful for clearing long distances midair, it can help you break a specific kind of glass, and if you boost at the same time that you do a trick, you get a ton of extra points, which is always appreciated. But really, that's about all that you do with it. For the insane amount of boost capsules littered throughout the stages and the heavy emphasis placed on it in the game's tutorial, you'd think it would be utilized more as a regular part of your moveset, but most of the time there's no reason to use it. It's not really an issue with the game and it's kind of easy to ignore, just a little perplexing. So that pretty much covers the mechanics, and yeah, compared to other skaters, they're quite simple and you could even say lacking in depth. 
However, while that's true, I would argue that it doesn't detract from the game at all, and it's actually quite fitting given the game's structure. It's easy to call it a skating game, and I've even done it myself, but realistically speaking, the game is actually much closer to a collectathon platformer. Let me explain myself. First up, the collectibles themselves. These take the shapes of CDs so that you can listen to certain songs on demand, outfits so that you can change your character's appearances, and new graffiti art to throw up wherever you want. They are small rewards, but they're scattered across the stages fairly frequently and make for effective micro rewards for exploring the stages. Still though, these aren't really equivalent to a collectathon game, as those games directly gate progression behind the number of collectibles you have. These are really just cool extra stuff. But if you look a little bit more closely, you'll realize that Bomb Rush Cyberfunk actually does have an equivalent to that, the graffiti. Sure, you may not technically collect it, but functionally it serves the exact same purpose. You progress by talking to members of each different crew and performing challenges for them, but they won't give you the time of day unless you have enough reputation points from spraying graffiti around the area. So when you break it down, covering each area with the graffiti is the primary way to progress in the game. Another big part of the game that adds to my platformer comparison are the dream stages. These are essentially the equivalent to Mario Sunshine's floodless stages, or Mario Odyssey's one-off sections, or any other comparable stages from any other platformer you could think of. These come at the end of every chapter, and on top of being visually arresting with stunning psychedelic visuals, they have very linear level design not at all conducive to long combos. They are pure platforming challenges, and with this game's movement and sense of constant flow, they're a ton of fun. And that same state of constant flow, while portrayed very differently, is exactly what all of the main areas in the game are also designed around, and it's so much fun. Take Millennium Mall, for example. This sprawling playground with multiple different sectors filled with long rails, endless corners, and a ton of risky opportunities to flex your moves. Finding ways to string combos together between the different sectors of levels can be tricky, but so satisfying to plan and pull off. Every area in the game is designed specifically to provide countless opportunities like this, and it's one of the most important reasons this game is able to maintain such an incredible flow state. Even the game's combat adds into this flow state, if you can even call it combat. Really all it boils down to is using the tricks that you're normally doing to fend off police. It's a pretty seamless integration of the game's mechanics into a different context, and I really appreciate it for that. I will admit though, the few times that the game slows down and forces a combat encounter, it can be pretty rough. This game is just not built for combat no matter how you look at it, and I think it works fine as a part of normal gameplay, especially when you can still generally retain your combo while attacking enemies, but when that combat is shoved into the spotlight, the cracks start to show fast, and it can feel pretty sloppy. Boss fights are almost never fun because of this. There's one that's pretty good because it's just focused on sliding around, so it only uses the movement mechanics, but the rest of them are comically awkward dances around a basic arena trying to deal damage in a way that just doesn't feel good or effective, no matter what you do. The final boss fight is an especially bad sore point for me, and this one doesn't even actually use the combat, but it does take away your control of the camera, making it way more difficult than it should be to judge jumps. Not a good experience at all, and kind of a baffling weak point to end such a great game on. Still though, I can't stress enough, these are such a small part of the game, and they are so easy to look past and ignore. The vast majority of this game is the insanely fun core gameplay that's rock solid. I can't even tell you how much time I spent in my first playthrough completely ignoring all the objectives and just skating around endlessly for hours. For no other reason than it's just so enjoyable. The level design combined with the mechanics make for an experience that's easy to pick up, but very difficult to put down, especially once you start getting good enough to get those really high scores. This game feels incredible to play well, and nothing cements that more than if you decide to replay it. A second playthrough of this game is much easier than a first, not because anything has actually changed, but you realize how much you've grown since you started playing, and your pre-existing knowledge of these areas makes them so much fun to blaze through. Areas that you spent hours in can now be cleared in just a fraction of that time, and the game's pacing becomes even more rapid. And that's assuming that you can resist the temptation to aimlessly screw around before moving on. The highlights for me are the challenges with the other crew members. It is so easy to meet their demands, though so each time you run into one, it turns into a self-imposed challenge of seeing just how far you can exceed their demands and completely embarrass them. You want me to hit a times 5 multiplier? Okay, here's a times 91. 
And that's not even mentioning the crew clashes at the end of each area which become immensely satisfying. It's almost comical how quickly they can get outpaced when you really know what you're doing. I loved the game on my first playthrough, but the second only made me further appreciate everything this game has going for it. The extraordinarily fun movement, the outstanding level design, the unmatched flow state, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk is a relentlessly engaging experience from front to back. I've got my gripes with a few small aspects, but they're so minor compared to just how strong the core of the experience is. It's really hard to overstate just how much fun I had with this game, and how much I wish it was held up in high regard alongside the other powerhouses of 2023. I enjoyed this just as much as Hi-Fi Rush, a fantastic game with similar energy that got well-deserved acclaim across the board. And while I certainly don't want to detract anything from that game, I can't help but wish that the same attention was given to Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. It's such a great time, and it's incredibly good at sucking you into its gameplay loop and sense of presentation hard from minute one. If you didn't play this last year, I seriously can't recommend enough that you seek it out and find what you've been missing out on.